Michael Popa, Executive Director of the Mainstream Coalition, and welcome to Mainstream Live. It's our series of conversations with figures in Kansas politics, advocacy, and community building. Uh, for almost 30 years, Mainstream has been fighting extremist voices in Kansas and partisan rhetoric to achieve common sense government and healthy communities. And our work has never been more important than this year. If you'd like to be involved with Mainstream, please visit our website at mainstreamcoalition.org. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Senator John Skubel of the 11th District. Senator Skubel, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. Ah, oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining. So uh, how are you holding up during this pandemic? Uh, you know, uh, I'm used to being around people, so this is hard for me. Um, I'm, I'm used to rotary breakfasts. I'm used to uh, meetings with the chambers. Um, and so my business life, I, uh, I do business development and client relations. And so I'm usually out for coffee or breakfast in the morning and always lunch in the afternoon. And so it's been uh, rather difficult for me to be sheltered in. And then in the evening, uh, you know, I was usually always out for one or two events, uh, three a week, but uh, this has taken a lot of wind out of my sails. Sure, definitely. I think that's happening for a lot of people. I'm kind of a introvert or I'm an extrovert as well. Um, and I do wanna mention that um, I think people may only be seeing my face on the screen but uh, Senator Skubel is with us by phone uh, because he could not uh, could not be with us by video today. So he is here. I'm not I'm not um, using his voice. <laughs> right. <laughs> Affirm that for me, please. <laughs> so uh, what are you doing to uh, get through this then? You know, basically, um, I try to um, get out as much as I possibly can to get into the office and uh, our front door at the office is locked. Um, we have all of our engineers uh, at home working. Uh, and in fact, they've absconded with my computer. So I, uh, I don't have a computer. And when I left the Capitol, I was leaving so fast, I didn't grab my computer there. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of computerless right now. But um, the, big, the big thing about it is, is that uh, most of my work now is done by phone. Uh, I probably will make four or five business calls a day. Um, some people are at home. Some people are, you know, very seldom in the offices. So it's really hard to run down people unless I've got cell numbers for them. So are you hearing, uh, as far as constituents go, are you, are you hearing more or, or less from them right now during this time? A uh, tremendous amount of emails. In fact, I just cleared 40 emails just before we got on. Uh, and that was from 10 o'clock this morning. I'll get on an average of 100 to 125 emails a day uh, requesting some kind of information. And usually that's information that I don't have. Um, and I'd have to be forwarded on to a department. Um, and they have been very good to reach out to people to try and figure out how to get registered for unemployment. Uh, you know, whatever their questions are, uh, they're having problems with a driver's license. Uh, but it seems like I'm getting more of those. And I think it's because we have light staffs in departments now. I think that there a lot of them are working from home too. Sure. Uh, well, uh, to that point, uh, last week, the governor announced her phased reopening plan at Astra. Um, wh what do you think of that? Uh, do you think we're opening too soon? You know, I don't know. And again, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical personnel. But uh, as we talked about uh, Dr. Norman, I have a great deal of faith in him. And uh, I think that uh, at least I hope that the governor is listening to him. And uh, I don't think that he would do anything that was going to endanger us. Uh, I think health and safety of our, of our Kansas uh, populace is the first and foremost on everybody's mind. I know a lot of people would like to open businesses um, you know, be back to where we were at before this started. And uh, I, I would love that myself, but uh, I think that I would err on the side of caution. Sure. And I think that's what the governor has done um, throughout this uh, pandemic. And um, it's, I think it's been a really smart move, like you said, listening to uh, Dr. Mor Norman. Um, in the first phase, uh, there are some businesses that are are still not allowed to open. So I'm looking here, we have community centers, large entertainment venues, uh, so different activities, 
and then bars, nightclubs, uh, excluding those that are uh, obviously operating curbside or delivery. Uh, do you think that, uh, or what have you been hearing, I, I guess I should ask, about that phased, uh, the phased approach from your constituents? You know, and it's, and it's kind of been um, a variety of things. A lot of people would like to have everything opened up. Um, a lot of them think that, um, you know, we can go ahead and do this and not endanger anyone. And again, I'm just not a medical professional and I'll listen to those people. Uh, I would like to see the barber shops open up. My wife cut my hair and um, I wear a hat quite a bit, but it's not quite as bad as I thought it was gonna be. But uh, a barber shop would be nice, but I don't know how they're going to be able to do. I My, my barber doesn't have six feet long arms, so I don't know how that's gonna work out. But, right, and if, if there were a barber that has six feet long arms, uh, I would think that uh, they would uh, be, They'd be busy. They'd be packed. So we wouldn't I be able to get in not. anyway. <laughs> I know I, I'm waiting. I'm hoping for the same thing soon. Um, I tried to cut my own hair and it was disastrous. <laughs> so it's in the back, so you can't see it, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> well, half uh, covered a lot of mistakes. Yeah, I know. Right. And that's about what I wear all the time now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, speaking of opening, um, the LCC is meeting today, uh, 3 p.m., I believe. And they're going to consider the possible reopening of the legislature for a wrap-up session. Uh, any ideas on what the outcome of that might be? No, and I've, I've talked a little bit to, about uh, this with leadership, understanding that, you know, I think that we're still going to have to do the six feet um, distancing. And I, uh, I know the House floor is even tighter than the Senate floor. Um, my, my office mate or my uh, floor mate is probably less than three three feet away from me on the Senate floor. And then I'm on an aisle. So I have people in and out behind me all of the time. So I think that's going to be somewhat of a problem if we go back into the chamber. Um, I've read the Constitution and it says that we have to be in our seats to vote. But it doesn't say that we have to all be in the chamber at the same time. So there may be some ways that if they do call us back, uh, that we can listen in our offices and then be called to the floor to vote. But uh, I'm not uh, too much in favor of uh, going up and, and having us all together because no one knows where anybody else has been. Uh, and, and, you know, the other problem is, is if they'll just lock 165 of us in there with the necessary staff, I'll be okay with that. But if we open this up to the lobbyists and everybody from the outside, I think that's going to be an issue, at least for me. Sure. Have you heard um, if they've secured any uh, PPE for the uh, legislators? No, not at all. Uh, okay. I, I have no idea if they've got personal protection lined up for us or not. I know that, you know, I I never thought I'd wear a mask in the hen house. I never thought that I'd be, you know, robbing hen house, but I kind of feel like, you know, I'm a robber when I go in with a mask on. Right. Uh, or a superhero. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, my, my cape doesn't fit anymore. But oh. The big thing about it is, is that, um, you know, when we're, when we're out, we do wear a mask when we go into the grocery stores. And that's about the only places that we have been. I've made a trip, I think, to Home Depot. I've had a couple of light switches that have gone out and some things like that. But uh, that, again, is pretty much with a mask and in and out. But uh, it's, it's a different life right now than I've ever, I've ever encountered. Right. I think uh, for many of us, this is probably our first real pandemic that's that's affected us so uh, so broadly you know, and so deeply. Um, what happens if you don't go back to the legislature? Uh, you know, I think I would be I would be somewhat happy. There are some bills that I would like to see us work tackle and, and see what happens. But, um, you know, I'll uh, I'll go with the I'll go with the group. And if they want us back, uh, I'll be there on the date and the time that they tell me to be there. Excellent. And you know, this pandemic hasn't hasn't just affected uh, you know people's habits. You know, it's it's affected budgets as well as well. Um, you know, due to business closures and job losses because of this pandemic, the CRE is predicting a 1.2 billion dollar decrease in revenues this fiscal year and next. Uh, what do you think uh, some of the ways uh, are that the state can make up for uh, that lost revenue? Well, I think that there's going to they're going to they're going to struggle to do that. Um, sales tax is going to just be take a terrific hit. Uh, 
I, I know that, you know, about the only thing that we're shopping for is on Amazon. Um, the UPS truck can still find us and the FedEx folks, but uh, we're not spending as much money as we normally would. Um, you know, I'm not buying new ties and I'm not buying new shoes and I'm not getting my hair cut. So uh, I think that we'll struggle with revenue. Um, and I think that there's going to be some trimming of the budgets. So I've heard that, you know, April revenues are down. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the tax deadline being moved to July 15th. Have you seen any projections or heard of any uh, projections on tax recovery in light of the pandemic? Do you think we'll see the same receipts as it were? Uh, and again, I, uh, I had my taxes figured early and um, I filed, one of the reasons I filed is I got a return this year for some reason, but Congratulations. Uh, yeah, uh, that was kind of a shock. Uh, but I, I think that we'll see a decrease in, in, uh, in tax revenues. How much, I have no idea. But um, I think that a lot of people probably, you know, if they, if they filed, it's going to be um, kind of helter-skelter as to what it was. Um, I know that it should have cut off in January. But again, um, I've not talked to any of the tax people, but uh, I, I think that it will be interesting to see what those tax revenues are going to be. Uh, and hopefully they won't be damaging. Right. And that's, I think that's what we all hope. Um, and you said there were you know, a few bills that you still wanted to work. Uh, but one bill that did get signed in um, earlier last month uh, by Governor Kelly, it was a bipartisan, bipartisan Senate bill, and it created the 10-year transportation plan to address the failing infrastructure. Uh, could you uh, tell us just a few of the key elements that are in that plan? Yeah, in fact, I, uh, I, put, that, uh, I put that bill together and uh, done everything but presented on the Senate floor. We had, uh, we had Ways and Means Chair go ahead and do that. Uh, but the big thing is, is that it, it basically takes us to the next 10 year plan, the third one, the uh, Ike uh, Legacy Plan, it's uh, a ten, about a ten billion dollar plan that uh, will take care of uh, first of all the um, existing plan, um, which we owe about four hundred and fifty million dollars on. And we had a rather large committee that was put together, and uh, I would say almost to a person, uh, the consensus was is that we should finish T Works before we start into a new plan, um, and. I think that a deal is a deal. When you tell people you're going to do something, I think that you should do it. And if you don't, I think you start losing uh, the faith of the people. And I don't think that that's someplace that any of us wish to be. But we have about $450 million that we need to go ahead and finish up some, some uh, projects for people. Uh, and then we'll start in on the plan. And, and uh, the plan basically will be put together um, by KDOT. And um, the big thing is, is they, and, and I will say one thing about the committee, I'm very proud of them. They understand that preservation is the most important thing that we have to do. Uh, not building edifice and, and roads and airports uh, in our names. The big thing is, is that it takes about 500 million a year just to maintain the existing system that we have. And that's quite a bit of money. Uh, I would like to see a robust infrastructure plan come out of the federal government. And I keep waiting and waiting and hearing that it's coming, but we've not seen anything. Uh, we're getting as many pipeline projects as we can uh, or, or projects into the pipeline as fast as we can. So if there is infrastructure money that we're going to be able to qualify for, uh, that would boost that money up a little bit because I think some of that money is going to disappear. And am I correct in um, I'm stating that uh, the plan um, has in it that uh, every county will receive at least $8 million in uh, transportation funds and improvements? Yes. Uh, and again, uh, one thing that I think is going to be unique about this plan is that it will be reviewed every two years and the Secretary of Transportation and her um, leaders will go out into the communities again to say, does the ABC plan still work for you? 
or is there other things that have bubbled to the top? Uh, 10 years for a plan today is hard. I lobbied to do that every year, which I think would have put a lot of stress and strain on the uh, staff, but uh, things change very fast in our world and a major corporation or plant coming to a community can change their trans transportation needs very, very fast. So that's gonna be one thing I think that's going to be very helpful. So if you have a road over on the east side of town that needs to be moved to the west side of town, that's going to be able to be accomplished with those meetings. And I think that that's going to be, well, I know that it's been very, very well received by the, uh, the people in Kansas uh, that uh, help with uh, transportation. And uh, it also includes uh, some broadband and new technology investments as well. Yes, it does. And that's not nearly as robust as I would have liked for that to have been. Uh, you know, I, I hearken back to when we electrified the United States, and uh, that pretty much was done by the federal government. And, you know, it's just like most farmhouses. If you're at the end of the line, um, you know, they could, they could run, they could run broadband five miles to your house. Well, they will never recover that money. I think that if we're going to go ahead and get broadband into, into our community, we'll have to do it just like we electrified the, uh, the, the country. But we'll uh, do as much as we can. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, I think that's a, a, it, it's key, as you said, to getting uh, broadband and um, technology out into uh, places that don't have it now or have weak signals, especially now in light of the pandemic. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've, seen uh, we've all seen um, people that just can't use services like telemedicine and such very definitely and, and you know i was shocked to find out in desoto kansas until about six or seven months ago the kids that were on the uh, south side of the highway they had to drive to mcdonald's they had to drive to the schools they had to sit outside the libraries in order to do their homework because they didn't have reliable internet in their houses. Um, and they got that remedied luckily for that area, but it's just not rural areas. We're seeing that in, in communities that we would have never dreamed of. When, when I found out or heard that, I was shocked. Uh -huh. uh, and so I think that there are a lot of areas and I don't think you want your kids uh, parked outside of the library at, in February when it's you know 10 degrees outside doing their homework. Cool. And, you know, it's not fair if other people can sit inside their house and do it, uh, but you have to make that extra effort to get out uh, just to use uh, internet, you know, communicate with people. Well, uh, and especially I, now, I mean, we're doing so much homeschooling. Right. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard if they don't have broadband to be able to do homeschooling. Um, so we have, we have some hoops to jump through. And I know that there was a study that was done and, um, you know, I don't, think that there are a lot of answers from that study other than we need more money to get broadband into these communities. All right. Uh, speaking of, um, the legislature, uh, you know, has a has had a habit in the past of transferring money out of transportation to uh, fill gaps in the budget. So how do you think that we can protect the transportation funding without creating another hole? Yeah, and we, when we looked at that, I mean, we, you know, I guess we could could look at a constitutional amendment that that money has to stay. Uh, the only dollars that you know are, are off the table are basically federal dollars that come in, and we can't take that to balance our budget. And that's basically what we've done with you know the money that should go to KDOT. We've used it to balance our budget when things get to where we don't have enough money to do that. And um, you know, gas tax is pretty well protected too. And uh, I'm looking at, along with others, the potential of a, a trigger that would kick in if we take so much money from, from KDOT to balance our budget, this trigger would kick in on five cents a gallon on gasoline or whatever the number needs to be to potentially make up that shortfall. Uh, and I'm, I'm a proponent of, of miles driven. Uh, you know, if you drive 50 miles on our highways, you're not going to do nearly, you know, the wear and tear as if I drive 500,000 miles on the highways a year. And so I think that we need to get down to kind of a use uh, with what we're doing. And a number of, a number of states are starting to do studies on this. And I would like to get involved in that. And I know that uh, Julie Lorenz, our Secretary of Transportation, has helped some of those communities 
in her former jobs. And we've talked about that at length. So I think if that's another option that we can look at and how it's protected, I don't know. I haven't gotten that far yet. You think uh, being part of that study might be something that uh, constituents could look forward to in uh, the next session or even next year? I, I would think probably that would be pushing it. Okay. It's going to take some effort to figure out how we're going to accumulate that data. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are really scared of me knowing how many miles, I guess, you drive. I, I don't think they want us to know where they're going. Uh, f for me, it's not much of an my issue. Phone, my phone already does that. Yeah, I know. I mean, they can <laughs> right. track me anywhere they want. So. Yeah. Uh, but th the thing about it is, is that I, th I think that we need to look at a lot of different ways to protect funding for transportation. Uh, and, and, you know, the big thing is, is that um, we have about the sixth highest miles for a state in the country. And when you start to think about it with our agricultural community, uh, we have a lot of dirt roads that are only used two or three times a year when they plant and when they harvest. And other than that, they pretty much just sit there. Um, you know, old wooden bridges, in fact, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a promo for uh, uh, KDOT uh, as they get ready to kick this off. And I'm going to go down to a bridge. It's not very far from the house that I go over two or three times a week when I'm down here. And it was built in 1927. And concrete is spalled off of the um, rebar that's uh, basically holding it up and it's starting to rust. But there's a bridge that's almost 100 years old and, and uh, it's still serviceable. But what we need to do is we need to make sure that it's structurally sound and the weights of the, of the vehicles that go across it today with grain are much greater than they were when that bridge was built. And uh, most of the widths of the roads down here are not made for the combines that we, that we have today. And so we, we do have some needs, but uh, we need to start balancing that out with the monies that we have. You uh, spoke earlier about miles driven. And it made me think of uh, pollution and uh, another crisis that we're in, and it's a climate crisis. Have mm -hmm. there been any uh, conversations in the transportation subcommittee related to sustainable public transportation like light rail? Uh, not so much of light rail, but busing. Uh, light rail is very, very expensive. It's about a million dollars a mile. And uh, most of that will be in, in highly popul populated areas like you'll see on the East Coast or the West Coast. Um, I know that Denver has looked at potentially expanding their line to go into the mountains to the ski areas and uh, where they're at with that, I have no idea. But bus systems are intriguing and they're running on uh, propane, they're running on different fuels that are a lot uh, more um, friendly to the environment. Great. Baby steps, but but good steps, right? That's right. Uh, and again, I don't think anything's going to happen completely overnight. But you know, we do see a lot of electrical vehicles and electrically assisted vehicles on the road today. And uh, for the first time, we recognize that because uh, these Teslas are really incredible cars. Uh, and they're very very expensive, but uh, they still are on the road. And with the batteries that they have, they're very heavy. And so we did put a minor tax on, on those because we weren't getting any gas uh, dollars from those. And so that's one thing that kind of changed with funding. Um, we also talked a little bit earlier um, about, you know, how, how the, the pandemic has made us uh, shelter in place, stay at home. People aren't getting out as much. They're, they're not driving as much. Um, let's let's, Go over to voting because that's going to be that is already a huge issue. We saw, um, you know, what happened in in, in Michigan. We have um, the Johnson County election uh, office at least is going to be sending out mail ballots to all registered voters. Uh, you sponsored a bill uh, in 2019, uh, SB uh, 43, and I think that was a, a bill that will allow voters to get registered the same day as the election. What What's the status of that bill? They tend to have some problems with broadband inside a lot of the voting areas. And so they need to go ahead and upgrade that, I think, before we can get there. Uh, and my thing is, is that they could go ahead and do a uh, contested ballot. And I could walk in and, and 
I don't know where you live, but I, I live at 135th and Metcalf. Mm -hmm. I can go to 143rd Street and vote from, from there early. And so they've got all of that data in the, in the system. Um, you know, that tends to work best for me to vote early. But uh, I will tell you this, and I swore I would never do it. I will be voting by mail for the uh, primary. Right. It, um, uh, a lot of people have to, but we do have to keep polling locations open as well for yep. people, like, like you said, who can't, who can't access um, mail, uh, I guess, or you know, other, other types of voting. Um, what is that going to look like, do you think, uh, as far as polling locations? What polling locations are going to be open where? Yeah, and again, I think that that's one of the problems that we tend to have today. Uh, you know, years ago, we had uh, voting and polling places in almost all of the schools. And today, they definitely don't want us in elementary schools, middle schools, uh, any high schools they struggle with. Uh, churches have pretty much been always open to uh, voting. And a lot of those are, are pulling back. And with the pandemic, I don't, I think it's even going to be harder with polling places. Uh, but again, I, I just think that, you know, we're going to see a different world and we're going to have to change. And, um, you know, I would love to be alive when we could go ahead and um, have a password that would come from the state or come from Johnson County that I could get onto my computer and it would load my um, potential uh, representatives uh school district, water district, uh, city councils, county governments, uh, state officials, uh, federal officials, uh, and I could vote from my house on my computer with that password. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that is coming and um, we, need to, we need to push towards those things. Well, um, shameless plug, uh, we're, we're not at the actual ballot stage, but mainstream does have uh, ksballot.org, where you can look up all that information. You can print out a sample ballot. You can take it to the polls, or you can use it at home to uh, cast your vote with a mail-in ballot. So we're, we're almost there. There's organizations that are working to get us there, at least. Well, I tell you, it takes me, when I go into the polling place, less than three minutes to vote, because I have read everything. I know exactly mm -hmm. who I'm going to vote for, and normally have one of those ballots, just like you're talking about. And... Um, you know, I don't struggle with knowing where, who I'm going to vote for. Uh, and I've read any, any special condition that's on the ballot, so I know whether I'm going to vote yes or no. And it's very, it's very important to be informed when you, go, when you go cast your vote, obviously. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do here at Mainstream. Um, <clears throat> the recent uh, talk about uh, teenagers manning the uh, polling locations. Uh, have you had any thoughts on that? No, but I tell you what, I'm, I'm always interested in involving our um, teenagers in the election process just as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, my father was a city police officer in Kansas City, Kansas. And on election day, I always went to the polling place with him, stood in line. And then I went in behind the curtain and we done all of the levers and uh, he cast his ballot and uh, he told me about the importance of voting. And uh, if I've missed an election, I don't know when it when it was. Uh, maybe when I was in college and couldn't get back for for that. But um, I, I think when I look at our our last city election in Johnson County, and especially Overland Park, we had 17 percent of the people in Johnson County vote. Uh, now that that's I think ashamed. Uh, mm -hmm. 17 percent, and I I serve in Overland Park on the city council. I affected people's lives every day. When you left your house, you probably were on a city street. Uh, and, and that government is the closest government to us and probably is the most important government to us for services. Um, and, and so I just, I get disturbed when we don't get any better turnout than that. Yeah, as do I. Um, well, is there anything else that you would like to uh, leave us with today? Oh, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about schools. Um, you know, I wished I knew what was going to happen with schools, whether mm -hmm. they will open in the fall or not. But again, we, we kind of brush back on it a little bit. But um, I'm concerned with trying to get these kids um, 
socially acclimated again with one another to where they can, you know, go to a dance, they can have graduation. I, I'm, I, I'm just really struggling with, you know, them not being able to walk across the stage. And uh, those are things hopefully that we'll be able to get worked out. And I think that, you know, we're out of the courts. Uh, mm -hmm. We have, we're still under their jurisdiction to make sure that we don't uh, backslide on the commitments that we have made, but uh, the, the lawsuit is not active. And uh, we have enough money in the budget, I think this year to go ahead and add the $137 million that we have to add. And so hopefully that's going to continue. And we continue to put as much money as we possibly can into higher ed, uh, because I'm gonna tell you what, the cost of higher ed today will, will keep a lot of our, our kids and students from going to college, I'm afraid. Uh, and I don't know that everybody has to go to college. There's lots of jobs that people can do today uh, that pay very well, uh, plumbing, electrical work, truck drivers. Uh, but again, I'd like to keep college affordable. And, and other than that, there are a lot of things that, you know, I could talk about. I mean, I've got a bill I sponsored now about distracted driving uh, to where you have to be hands-free with your cell phone that if we get back, uh, Hopefully we'll be able to run and we'll give the police a little bit better chance of enforcing that. Um, we see today about 60%, 70% of our accidents are due to distracted driving and that's too much. So is that, that's not already statewide legislation? No, we've got it in a few cities. They're, mm -hmm. they're further along than we are. Uh, but again, I, I think that if we can just get back to the task of driving and you know, I, when I was working at Johnson County Community College, I would go down 119th Street when I lived off of Hemlock. Um, and there was a guy in front of me probably two days a week that would have the Kansas City Star stretched out across the steering wheel and he would be reading the newspaper as he was going 40 miles an hour down 119th Street. Well, that's pretty dangerous. That's pretty dangerous. And I guess it's really what people are doing when they're looking at their phones. Yeah. You know, it's just not, it's not as big. It's not as spread out across the wheel, but it's taking up your attention. Well, the big thing is, is follow somebody on the road or on the highway and watch them text. Mm -hmm. uh, it's worse than drunken driving. I mean, they'll be in every lane in the whole world. Uh, and if you drive highway driving, it's even worse. But uh, I, I would like to see that bill passed. And uh, I would love to see Medicaid expansion passed. So thank you for your work on everything, on the Education Committee, on the Transportation Committee, chairing both of those committees, on the bills that you've uh, supported and uh, proposed. Uh, and um, I really appreciate you being here today. And thank you very much for having me and I uh, appreciate it very much. And uh, I hope that uh, these continue. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, maybe we'll get to talk to you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And uh, I want to also thank everyone who's watching um, on Thursday evening. Don't forget to tune in to Mainstream Live for my conversation with Representative Jared Owsley of the 24th District. And please remember to visit MainstreamCoalition.org to learn more about how you can make an impact in this year's elections. And one way is to walk the vote with us on June 13th. This year, we'll host a virtual walk in real communities all across Kansas. The week-long event is more than just a fundraiser for Mainstream. It's a movement for you to advocate for the issues most important to you and your loved ones. Learn more and register today at walkthevote.org. Thanks again for being here. Stay safe and remember to do more than vote with Mainstream in 2020.